This podcast contains murder and mayhem, guts and gore, adult language, and sexual content. Exactly what you came here for. All the listener discretion is advised. Welcome. I am your mistress of the macabre, Sarah Tierra. Grab your Ouija board, light the candles, and grab your jar of human teeth because you and I are going to escape for a bit. Pour yourself a cocktail, pull the window shades closed, and find a cool, dark, quiet place. Because right now we delve into the macabre. Hello and welcome back to the Mistress of the Macabre podcast. I am your host, of course, Sarah Tierra. Today I am very excited to bring you this age-old mystery. Well, kind of. It took place in 2007, but... I remember hearing about this. I'm guessing it was on Unsolved Mysteries, maybe. I personally feel that I solved this case, and I'm probably wrong, and you can definitely tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm on a little bit of a high because I dug into this, and I feel like I found an answer after all these years of wanting to know what happened here. We are talking about the Kirkendall family phone stalker mystery. What do you do when your personal cell phone has been turned into a spying device? When it's tracking your family's every move and giving an anonymous stalker a view into your private life, three Washington State families say it happened to them and left them feeling like they were living in a horror movie. The Kirkendall family's troubles started when 16-year-old Courtney Kirkendall's cell phone started sending text messages to her friends by itself, the family said. On June 25, 2007, Courtney randomly began receiving texts from her friends from her home in Furcrest, Washington. Upon looking at these texts, she was met with messages from her friends asking her why they had gotten text messages from her, simply saying, gay. That is the most 2007 teenager shit I've literally ever heard. Now, one could think it was a dumb, immature prank on Courtney's part except for one problem— Courtney didn't send those texts. Left mildly confused at what they were talking about, she brushed it off and thought nothing of it. Neither she nor anyone else involved could have imagined how far these strange occurrences were about to go. And then the threats came. A scratchy voice started to call her daily, sometimes to say that the entire family's throats would be slit. This was confirmed by Courtney's mother, Heather Kirkendall, and sometimes just calling to tell them they are all gay, but I don't know that for sure. Courtney, as well as her friends and family, all started receiving threatening text messages and phone calls from an unknown person who they all later referred to as restricted because that was what would come up on caller ID. As soon as restricted began making calls, they would regularly threaten to kill or rape the family members, children, or grandparents. Restricted also threatened to shoot up the schools they attended and even threatened to kill their pets. They say you're going to die, we hate you, we're going to murder you, said Heather, the mom, one of the victims. The family said the calls came in at all hours of the night and that no one seems to have an answer as to how or why it happened. Many of the voicemails sound like a teenager's prank. Sometimes they say really juvenile things. Sometimes it's really scary, Heather said. In one of the messages which Heather played for ABC News, the caller said, I know where you are. I know where you live. I'm going to kill you. This would be fucking scary, okay? If it's happening to your entire family and children and grandparents and they're threatening to slit your throat, like, yeah, the gay thing was funny, but that would be scary, I would be, well, we won't talk about me. (laughs) I'm not exactly normal. Having read many, many iterations of the same article from when this story peaked, I want to clarify one thing. Many articles refer to the victims as three families, which can make it sound like this is three unrelated groups of people. It was Courtney Kirkendall, the Kirkendall family, and her slightly older married sister Darcy Price, who was living with her husband and family in a different house, and then also Courtney's friend Andrea McKay 
and her family who lived across the street from Courtney's family. At least one other friend of Heather's, the mom, also said that her phone's ringtone changed without her involvement to a guttural voice saying, answer your phone. But when the Furcrest Washington police tried to find the culprit, the calls were traced back to the Kirkendall's own phones, even when they were turned off. The messages got to the point of coming through around the clock and would take place on both the family's landlines. Yes, it's 2007 and people had landlines back then. And the calls would also take place on their cell phones. In an attempt to stop restricted harassment, everyone affected went as far as switching phones, changing their numbers, turning their phones off, and getting new accounts. But nothing seemed to slow restricted down. At one point after Courtney and her family called the police after finally having enough of the harassment, and while in the middle of explaining their situation to an officer, all of their phones turned on and called each other. Things started looking bad for Courtney after the police traced the threatening messages back to her phone, which seemed to be able to send messages and make calls even when she had it powered off. Kirkendall, Price, and McKay say their family's phones have been turned on by themselves when they were switched off. Voicemails would arrive playing recordings of their own private conversations. At one point, the Kirkendalls had just returned home after meeting with a local detective concerning the phone calls when they received warnings not to talk to the cops. When they noticed they had a voicemail, it was a recording of the exact conversation from earlier that day that they had had with law enforcement. The level of fear went from, this is a pain, to an uncontrolled fear and anxiety level, said McKay. Heather said her family switched phones and opened new accounts twice, but the calls kept coming. If we go a day without a call, that's a good day, Heather said. Knowing some people thought Courtney had something to do with all the harassment, her parents took her phone away, but that also failed to get the harassment to end. To make matters worse, the family realized that Restricted, in addition to listening to everything they said, seemed to be able to see them as well, even when they were inside their home. The caller knew, the family said, what they were wearing and what they were doing. The caller seemed to know when the kids leave for school and when they are home alone, Heather said. Messages warned the McKay family that there would be a shooting at their daughter Andrea's school. Restricted would also call and make comments about what the family members were wearing. I can't. It's very original scream opening scene, which is truly terrifying. Although I would just tell them to go fuck themselves and never answer my phone again and get more dogs and a shotgun. I mean, not even a gun, just my trusty old baseball bat and some hellhounds and I'll take care of that shit. But the Kirkendalls got a new security system keypad for their home. Restricted called Heather moments later to leave a voicemail telling her that they knew the new passcode to it. The most infamous quote to come from Restricted during this time was in response to one of the victims, Andrea McKay, who was cutting limes on the counter and Restricted responded by messaging her to merely say, I prefer lemons. That is a proper horror movie line. I didn't have high hopes for Restricted after just calling everyone gay, but I have to say that that's pretty good. One night, an unknown person banged on the side of the family's house right before running off into the night. At this point, taping their camera lenses and even removing the batteries from their phones failed to stop Restricted. Whomever this person was and whatever their motives were, they seemed to have unexplained, full, unfettered access to the victim's phones. As it was not ever made certain if it was simply one stalker involved, let alone what the motive was, the only substantial evidence to come from the incident was the recordings of the voicemails left by Restricted, which had been described as, quote, throaty juvenile rasps stolen from bad horror movies, end quote. The ongoing harassment and lack of answers proved to be the stuff of nightmares, a crime in which the victims are continually terrorized by an unknown person who had no intentions of slowing down or even stopping, and the cops were left utterly baffled by it. The police say they are stumped, but they have not ruled out the possibility that the alleged victims are making the whole thing up. The callers have likely violated several laws, law experts say, possibly including federal wiretapping statutes. But the case has local law enforcement stymied. Quote, we're almost dumbfounded. We've never seen anything like this, end quote. 
said Fircrest Police Chief John Cheeseman, who said he has known the Kirkendalls for years. What a great name. I hope his people hail from Wisconsin. I bet they do. Cheeseman began working with the Tacoma Police and the Pierce County Sheriff's Department and also contacted officials at the Department of Homeland Security. So the police were taking this seriously, but the police were still not close to finding the perpetrators. Most of the harassment appears to be directed at Courtney Kirkendall, the police say, adding that most but not all of the calls have been traced back to her phone. The police are not calling the 16-year-old a suspect, though the unusual tale has raised some eyebrows. Quote, it wouldn't be prudent not to look internally, end quote, said Ed Troyer, a Pierce County Sheriff's Department detective. Quote, at this point, we aren't saying it's someone inside the family, but it's someone that is close enough to them to know this much about them, end quote, Troyer said. It seems like it's someone who's tied into the group, a family member, a friend, or an enemy. He added, I hope it isn't coming from within the family because it would be a waste of everyone's time. Heather is adamant that her daughter is not involved and says the calls kept coming even when they took Courtney's phone away. Courtney got the brunt of the suspicion and did not speak with the press about the situation, and I don't blame her. At 16, I would die of embarrassment if I, like, waved at someone in the hallway at school and they didn't wave back or if like I had a pimple I can't imagine what she was feeling she must have been mortified it was in the press everyone in town knew what was going on and that it kept being traced back to her I'm sure she was mortified although spoilers I don't think she did it and therefore she had no reason to be mortified quote we know it's not her end quote Heather said of Courtney and we can't think of anybody we've made mad or if we've made any enemies For reasons still unclear to this day, the mystery appears to have trailed off from there. There have been no new follow-ups, arrests, persons of interest, or anything since the attention on the case reached its peak. Some sources hint that the FBI did get involved and the calls stopped then, but that's it. Keep in mind, the very first iPhone had come out around the time of this strange attack, but whether this had any bearing on these events is anyone's guess. The way it stands, if the situation was ever officially solved, it has never been publicly stated by anyone involved, including either law enforcement or any of the victims. Cell phone companies are skeptical. Quote, we are unaware of any technology that would allow the activity that's being reported here, end quote, said Sprint spokesman Matt Sullivan. We are partnering with law enforcement to investigate investigate. We're not exactly sure what is being done to these phones. Cyberbullying, let's talk about it a little bit. In an age of rapidly advancing technology, some surveillance experts have told reporters that it's all too easy for hackers to turn your cell phone against you. James Atkinson, an electronic surveillance expert, has told reporters that cell phones can be operated remotely. You can take photographs remotely, you can track the person's position, you can figure out where the phone is, said Atkinson. Most cops have no idea how this is done. We know a lot more about how this is done today, but it might be safe to say that cops today still probably don't know how to do that. This whole incident itself is cyberbullying. Classic old-fashioned cyberbullying. We all know it. We all have been hearing about it for decades, but let's do a tiny little brush up as it will be relevant to my perpetrator profile. The calls appear to be just the latest 2007 incarnation of cyberbullying. According to an April 2007 survey of middle school kids by online safety group WiredSafety.org, the most prevalent threat children face through new technology is not the 40-year-old pedophile, but the kid sitting next to them in math class. At least 85% of the middle schoolers polled said they have been cyberbullied in the last year, in 2007, this is, picked on by another child, often anonymously, through the internet or a cell phone. Most bullying online or over the phone is done by another child, albeit anonymously. Quote, these situations recount how kids are hurting other kids, taking the bullying off the playground and into a much more anonymous and often more painful encounter on the phone and online, end quote said Perry Aftab, Wired Safety's director and a well-known internet security and cybercrime lawyer. 
Cyberbullying statistics in 2023 are going to be higher than in 2007 because now infants have iPhones. It's grown exponentially since 2007, but the age range statistics are what we are going to look at for a second. Looking at a study done by the Pew Research Center in 2007, one in three online teens have experienced online harassment and girls are much more likely to be victims. Depending on the circumstances, these harassing or cyberbullying behaviors may be truly threatening, merely annoying, or relatively benign. But several patterns are clear. Girls are more likely than boys to be targets, and teens who share their identities and thoughts online are more likely to be targets than those who lead less active online lives. Of all the online harassment asked about, the greatest number of teens said that they had had a private communication forwarded or publicly posted without their permission. One in six teens, 15 per reported someone had forwarded or posted communication they assumed was private. About 13% of teens said that someone had spread a rumor about them online, and another 13% said that someone had sent them a threatening or aggressive email, DM, or text message. 6% of online teens said that someone had posted an embarrassing picture of them without their permission. These results come from a nationally representative phone survey of 935 teenagers by the Pew Internet and American Life Project. As I said earlier, girls are more likely than boys to say that they have ever experienced cyberbullying. 34% of online girls report being bullied compared with 22% of online boys. Older girls in particular are more likely to report being bullied than any other age or gender group, with 41% of online girls ages 15 to 17 reporting these experiences. Teens who use social network sites like MySpace and Facebook and teens who use the internet daily are also more likely to say that they have been cyberbullied. Nearly 4 in 10 social network users have been cyberbullied in some way, compared with 22% of online teens who do not use social networks. One in eight online teens reported that someone had sent them a threatening or aggressive email, DM, or text message. One 15-year-old boy in a focus group admitted, I played a prank on someone, but it wasn't serious. I told them I was going to come take them from their house and kill them and throw them in the woods. It's the best prank because it's like, oh my god, I'm calling the police. And I was like, I'm kidding, I'm just messing with you. She got so scared though. You little fucking asshole. Make sure your teenage boys are aren't threatening to murder girls and put them in the woods. We've had enough of that. Thank you. So did a hacker's reign of terror crumble with the release of the iPhone? Did they lose their nerve when things got too serious and potentially the FBI got involved? Did they tire of scaring these three families and move on to new victims? Or did someone plot an elaborate joke to get on TV? Unfortunately, we may never know. Also, I think I know. I think I know. Well, let's go. Let's keep going. We'll find out. Let's get into theories. The number one theory that comes up is the hoax theory. One theory on the matter is that it was a hoax committed by Courtney. It was her phone and she could have done it to get on TV, in this case, the local news. In response to this, Courtney has defended herself saying, why would I do that to people I care about? Why would I harass my own family? And let's remember, Courtney was seemingly the only one being affected by this that did not want to talk to reporters. It doesn't make much sense. Her mother and family also adamantly insisted she didn't have anything to do with it. Under this theory, she, I guess, wanted to be constantly stressed out dealing with the police over and over again and being blamed half of the time, more than half of the time, actually. Was she even tech savvy like that? To me, Courtney is the primary victim, not the perpetrator. She was 100% targeted first, and then everyone else targeted after was directly connected to her. She's the primary focus, and you cannot convince me otherwise. So... I'm going to move on from the hoax theory. Next, we have the hacker theory. Unfortunately, we have to talk a little tech right now. I am now a technology podcast. Welcome. Just kidding. I don't fucking know that much about technology. I'm like a normal level of tech savvy, maybe a little like normal plus, but I'm definitely not a hacker. I definitely don't know how this shit works. So we're going to break it down a little bit just to get a basic understanding of how one would even or could even manipulate a phone the way that occurred in this incident, because that's the confusing part. That's the most confusing part about this. So we're going to do a very basic analysis here. All right. So first we're going to talk about spoofing a phone. 
phone. Phone number spoofing causes the caller ID to display a phone number or other information to make it look like the calls are from a different person or business. While the caller's information may appear local, the calls are often placed by telemarketers located outside of the state or even the country. Spoofing is usually done with malicious or unscrupulous motivations by the caller, and it has led many people to believe that you can no longer trust caller ID. Phone number spoofing has been used for years by people with a specialized digital connection to the telephone company. Law enforcement officials and collection agencies have been using the practice for years, sometimes in a legal way, but oftentimes not. In 2004, a company called Star38.com launched the first mainstream caller ID spoofing service to allow spoofed calls to be placed from a web interface. Many similar sites launched the following year. Phone number spoofing has also been used to scam sellers on websites like eBay and Craigslist. In these scams, a caller will contact the seller and claim to be calling from Canada with an interest in purchasing the advertised items. They will often ask sellers for personal information like a copy of their registration title, etc., and then repost the items for fake sale. Phone number spoofing is also used for vicious prank calls. For example, someone might call and arrange for a TV station or a doctor's office to appear on a recipient's call caller display and engage them in a prank. One viral news story in 2008 reported that a man was arrested for making threatening phone calls to women and having their own home numbers appear on the caller ID to make it look like the calls were coming from inside the house. Also, most recently, 2020 was the year of fucking getting spoofed constantly by scam artists. I don't know about you, but I got like 14 calls a day. They were fucking scammers, and usually they were like phone numbers from my home state, which is dumb because I haven't lived there in forever, but they don't know that. Anyways, okay, next up, we're going to talk about cloning a phone. Mobile phone cloning is a way of making a copy of the entire mobile phone data in another mobile phone by an illegal methodology. The purpose of such an activity is to make unauthorized use of the mobile phone. The data in the other phone would contain all the data of the previous phone that can be used for fraudulent activities or for making anonymous calls from the clone, causing the bill to be addressed to the correct mobile owner. Access to the electronic serial number ESN and mobile identification number MIN is required for cloning. This can be done by methods such as sniffing the cellular network. Network sniffing is used to diagnose network problems and analyze overall network and application activity, trashing the cellular companies or resellers, or by hacking the cellular providers. You can also physically get that from the phone. If you had access to the phone, you obviously could get the ESN and the MIN that way as well. General phone hacking. Phone hacking is the practice of exploring a mobile device, often using computer exploits to analyze everything from the lowest memory and central processing unit levels up to the highest file system and process levels. Modern open source tooling has become fairly sophisticated and has been able to hook into individual functions within any running app on an unlocked device and allow deep inspection and modification of their functions. The term came to prominence during the News International phone hacking scandal, in which it was alleged and in some cases proved in court that the British tabloid newspaper, The News of the World, had been involved in the interception of voicemail messages of the British royal family, other public figures, and a murdered schoolgirl named Millie Dowler. The unauthorized remote access to voicemail systems exposed by the News International phone hacking scandal is possible because of the weaknesses in the implementations of these systems by telcos. And Telco Systems is a global leader in telecommunications. So this specific company had weaknesses that allowed the hacking to take place. Are we on the same page? Did I lose you now that I'm a tech podcast? Please don't go. We're, we're almost done. Mobile phone voicemail messages may be accessed on a landline telephone with the entry of a personal identification number or PIN. Reporters for News International would call the number of an individual's mobile phone, wait to be moved to voicemail, then guess the PIN, which was often set as a simple default, such as 0000 or 1234. Even where the default PIN is not known, social engineering can be used to reset the voicemail PIN code to the default by impersonating the owner of the phone with a call to a call center. 
During the mid-2000s, calls originating from the handset registered to a voicemail account would be put straight through to voicemail without the need of a PIN. A hacker could use caller ID spoofing to impersonate a target's handset caller ID and thereby gain access to the associated voicemail without a PIN. Following controversies over phone hacking and criticism of mobile service providers who allowed access to voicemail without a PIN, many mobile phone companies have strengthened the default security of their systems so that remote access to voicemail messages and other phone settings can no longer be achieved, even via a default PIN. For example, AT&T announced in August 2011 that all new wireless subscribers would be required to enter a PIN when checking their voicemail, even when checking it from their own phone. To encourage password strengths, some companies now disallow the use of consecutive or repeat digits in voicemail pins. Reporters spoke with security experts who say they think they have the answer to the Kirkendall's mystery. It's relatively easy to spoof a phone, allowing a person to mask or alter the number that he or she is calling from, said ABC News consultant Brad Garrett, a former FBI agent. More sophisticated hackers can also clone a cell phone, allowing them to do just about anything the victim could do with their original phone, Garrett said. But cloning a phone would not allow someone to listen in on a phone call, which requires more sophisticated technology, Garrett said. Atkinson, a communications engineer who recently testified in front of Congress about a leak of classified Coast Guard information, told ABC News this case sounds like a game of cell phone manipulation. Atkinson, who said he has been trained by the National Security Agency, said the perpetrators would probably have to hack into a website operating operated by the cell phone companies. Someone is manipulating the software and firmware in their cell phones and are exploiting weaknesses or features in the phone, like the GPS, customized rings, and internal voicemail that are installed by the manufacturer to provide special services, he said. Despite the complexity of the software programs used to hack into phones, technology experts say that even a prankster new to the game can cause trouble. Inexperienced hackers can use programs to developed by more tech-savvy hackers to break into computers and cell phones, Atkinson said. Commonly between the age of 15 and 25, baby hackers see these hacks as a way of asserting themselves, he said, much in the same way bullies beat others up. Countless technology companies had contacted the McKays, claiming that they have the equipment that the police lack to find the hackers. Detective Troyer disagreed. We have that technology, and yet all of our tracking leads to dead ends, he said. Methods for tapping a phone involve everything from getting your hands on the device and manually cloning it, to using software in order to keep an eye on someone from a distance. The proliferation of articles about how easy it is to hack a phone makes it all the more plausible that someone who lived near the Kirkendalls decided to have a little phone fun before things got out of hand. We are talking about 2007 here, a time in which landline phones in MySpace were still a thing and when streaming a TV show or movie on your phone was not yet possible. The calls to the Kirkendalls were coming through in 2007 the same year that the iPhone was released. This means that the digital technology required to tap into someone's phone would have been easy to find. At that time, all you needed to listen to someone's voicemail was their four-digit passcode, which is easy enough to guess. In addition, with the right software, you could track a person's every movement due to GPS technology. However, it was never specifically stated that the Kirkendalls even had the brand new tech that was the iPhone. A suburban family in Furcrest, Washington, might not have had shiny new iPhones for themselves and their teenage children. In fact, if they had all had iPhones, I feel like that would have been specifically mentioned more than any other type of phone. Brand new, huge, big thing is this easily hacked? I think that would have been included in the news coverage and there was a ton of news coverage and that was never brought up. So I'm going to rule out that they had iPhones. Some argue that Restricted was using some kind of hack or virus to control the phones, possibly with inside help from either a deliberate confederate, i.e. someone who could smuggle their family member's phone out to Restricted for some hands-on fuckery, or a clueless accomplice, i.e. a theory that Courtney kept reinfecting her new phone by visiting her MySpace page. That one comes up a lot. 
I don't know why they, I mean, I don't agree with that. But that comes up a lot that she was reinfecting her phone through her MySpace page. I don't buy that. The online opinions run the gamut from literally it's so easy in 2007, it could be done no problem, to like you have to work for the military to be able to do that. Then there's the question of accessing the phones of the victims. How could the stalker get that much access to that many people's phones? So if the hacking did have to take place with physical access to the phone, then there's a question of how the stalker could get that much access not only to Courtney's phone, but to all the family members' phones and the other victims' phones as well. How would that happen? That makes it seem difficult to do, right? So they're hacking it and they're potentially getting physical access to all of these phones. It seems pretty sophisticated to me. That's my personal opinion. Next, we are going to talk about the old-fashioned stalking. Yes, good old-fashioned old-timey stalking because besides the cyberbullying taking place in this case, there's also the element of old-fashioned stalking as well. One law enforcement officer suggested that they might have a quote tech-savvy teenage boy end quote in their neighborhood who was doing this. Sure, a kid who lives in the neighborhood or across the street can creep on people the old-fashioned way. Also, when I'm saying old-fashioned way, I'm talking about the banging on the side of the house, the peeping in windows to see what people are wearing and where they are, because that is going on this whole time as well, as all the phone stuff. So that is what I mean by old-fashioned stalking, by the way. At least one skeptic online has also pointed out that you don't have to either hang the entire story on spooky phone can see you cutting up limes with its all-seeing lens versus utter hoax. There are some more low-tech approaches that enable you to make sinister statements about someone's meal prep or how their shirt looks, such as looking through the windows or texting with someone who is in the room right next to your victim. Again, with the banging on the side of the house, knowing when the kids were at school or at home, that's all very psycho boy next door, old-fashioned peeping Tom shit. So we have a range of behaviors happening here, but the old-fashioned Joseph D'Angelo type stalking behavior does not explain any of the other attacks that were centralized to their phones. Then we have the online theory that it didn't even happen. So not just it's a hoax, but like straight up didn't even happen. Ultimately, with everything said and done, many questions arose over whether or not the crime ever happened at all. Long after the attention on the case died down, most of the reports on it are based on one primary victim. Courtney. Almost every one of the technological wonders ascribed to Restricted and the cell phones is based on the report of one of the victims. Regarding the detail about the family's phones turning on in the presence of a police officer, no such public statements appeared to have been made on the claim. And the we had a voicemail recording of ourselves talking to the cops stories are purely based on what the families say. If the police officer who saw the phones turn themselves on was around in 2007, he didn't make any statements on record. If you've ever gotten a pocket dial from someone or have accidentally opened your camera app when pulling your phone out of your pocket, you're aware that we don't exactly spend much of our lives in situations where our phones can record nice clean audio or have a good view of what we're doing. All the less so in 2007 when watching Hulu on your screen while you fix dinner wasn't an option. This is me being devil advocate, but I'm bad at it. I included tons of quotes from the police and other experts that did investigate and were baffled, but some people still say there's no proof. And I'm just saying those people are fucking wrong. Okay, moving on. This is a little side nugget of information that I found. This is not a theory online. This is a Sarah theory, okay? But... I found it very interesting that Courtney and her family did live near McCord Air Force Base and her brother-in-law did work there. He even received a text from Restricted at one point, which reportedly said, McCord needs us. Was this one-off to throw suspicion away from the brother-in-law or is it simply another person directly connected to Courtney that was in her contacts and therefore targeted? It's a very strange little clue. It doesn't come up a whole lot but it is confirmed that it happened. On one hand, getting to someone Courtney knew inside McCord Air Force Base would be a high achievement for little punk ass restricted. Maybe he only sent one because things were already pretty hot with law enforcement and he didn't want to fuck around and find out with the Air Force. Or maybe it was the brother-in-law saying, look, it couldn't be me. I got a text too. 
Another thing that's very strange to me is that the brother-in-law got a very respectful and appropriate text. Like, why is he getting a salute from Restricted? And everyone else is gay or about to be murdered. It seems a bit off the context of that text. Also, there's the fact that several high-ranking members of the government and tech world agreed that the technology being used to terrorize the family was sophisticated, military-level technology. My eyebrow raised over this one, for sure. I'm, I'm suspicious. I'm not super suspicious, but I'm a little suspicious. No, I'm suspicious as fuck. That's suspicious. That's weird. I want to know more character traits of this man, the brother-in-law. Was he a good husband? What was his relationship like with his wife and his in-laws? Has he ever been caught or charged with committing any prowling or peeping Tom type activities? Did he have a preference for teenage girls? What kind of porn was he watching? I have so many questions. Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. I just have lots of questions about this man. And I found that little detail very strange. But we will get back to it. Okay, now I'm going to play a little bit of Devil's Advocate again. I'm always going to cover all the bases, even if they're not what I think happened. This is the internet versus Sarah Tierra. Here is what the internet thinks, okay? How real is it? And how worried should you be that some creepy stalker is using your own cell phone to monitor your every move? The answer to both questions, not very. Let's take a look at each of the claims or beliefs reported by the Kirkendalls. 1. Unauthorized listening through the phone's microphone. As the security experts are eager to tell the media during publicity-enhancing interviews, it's possible to eavesdrop on conversations through a cell phone microphone, even when the phone appears to be off. In law enforcement circles, it's called a roving bug. Though possible, even through the downloading of a Java-based program, it's not likely. Such downloadable hacks are very rare and would need to be reinstalled with new accounts or new phones, as the Kirkendalls claimed they had gotten. Courtney is reportedly a MySpace user. If she visits a MySpace page with a phone-snooping Trojan of some kind with each new phone, then she could keep reinfecting her new phones. But it's very unlikely that a stranger with no physical access to the phone could repeatedly and quickly pull this off. 2. Unauthorized watching through the phone's camera. This one is clearly bogus, they say. Although technically possible, the problem is that cameras are almost never pointed directly at people accidentally. Take out your camera right now. If it was on and a hacker was in control of it, would it be videotaping you? One of the alleged victims, Andrea McKay, says that while cutting limes, the caller phoned her and told her he preferred lemons. Was the camera phone pointed directly at her in the kitchen? It's much more likely that someone looked in the window. Reminder, again, this is 2007, way before the front and rear facing cameras. There was only one camera on the back of the phone. 3. Remote turning on of phone when off. Some phones, including Blackberries, Nokias, and others, will be turned on by a set alarm. Many phones are never really off unless the battery is removed. There are no known Trojans or applications that enable a remote hacker to turn on at will a cell phone that is currently off. 4. Ringtones are changed. This can be theoretically done with a downloadable Java hack, but again, it's unlikely without physical access to the phone. 5. Problem continues with new phones and new accounts. Control over a cell phone can come about in only one of three ways. Installing software with physical access to the phone, using a downloadable Trojan or hacking the carrier's website for phones that rely on the internet to store account settings. If some hacker were able to do this, it might explain some of the events such as the changing of ringtones and spoofed calls, but not others. 6. Most of the calls and text messages traced back to Courtney's phone. There are four possibilities here. The first is that Courtney Kirkendall is in on the hoax. The second is that someone is stealing and using her phone. The third is that her phone has been cloned. And the fourth is that her number is being spoofed. Someone is calling from another phone, but making it appear as if the calls are coming from Courtney's phone. Spoofing is the easiest to do, although it doesn't explain some of the other attacks, such as gaining access to the cell phone's microphone. Why the majority of the internet thinks this whole thing is bogus. It's theoretically possible that some hacker with the voice of a nine-year-old is simultaneously applying several rare, difficult-to-apply hacks that explain most of the claims made by the Kirkendalls. It's also theoretically possible to win three lotteries in one day. It's just not very likely. It is thought the family is being socially engineered, 
more than hacked. Though presented as an unprecedented and new kind of cybercrime, the internet seems to think this is just simple cyberbullying. Reports say that nearly one third of U.S. teenagers have been exposed to cyberbullying. One of the most common themes of cyberbullying is threats of violence against female teens or the female relatives of teens. The Kirkendalls fear their cell phones are watching them, but it's more likely that some neighborhood kid is just looking in the window. But the main reason this story doesn't hold water is that solving the mystery is so simple. First of all, the Kirkendalls should simply remove the batteries from their cell phones until they catch the kid doing all of this. Does the stalker still call the house's landline phone with intelligence about what's happening at the house? If so, he's watching by some other means besides their phones. The Kirkendalls claim they have removed the batteries, but simultaneously claim that the cell phone hacking hasn't stopped. It can't be both. The Kirkendalls have told millions of Americans through the media that they're terrified to the point of paralysis, but apparently not terrified enough to stop using their phones for a while. Nor have they switched to phones that don't support internet access or Java or switch carriers. Secondly, the perpetrators are occasionally banging on the sides of their house. Why not simply install a motion-detected camera system? Either the banging will stop or they'll get a photo of the stalker. Who is spreading the terror? Primetime News is well known for spreading needless fear, especially when evil new technology is to blame. And this story is especially problematic fear-mongering. One newscaster on Fox News said, This is beyond stalking. This is terrorism in the worst form. We call it bullying. We call it little kids acting out. It's not. It's terrorism. It also proves no technology or law can guard you against bad behavior. Most reasonable people think suicide bombs against busloads of children or September 11 might be examples of terrorism in the worst form. Some kid leaving hateful prank messages is not terrorism. The story also doesn't prove that no technology or law can guard you against bad behavior. Remove the battery from the cell phones and install a camera. There. Technology is now guarding you against bad behavior. How do they pick people for these newscaster jobs? Teenagers have been leaving messages like these trying to scare girls or impress their friends since the telephone was invented. Some kid leaves creepy phone messages and now millions of TV viewers are left with the impression that demonic hackers might be stalking us all through our cell phones. The reality is that the cell phone is the worst thing that ever happened to real stalkers. Would-be victims are able to snap and send camera phone pictures call for help, and videotape stalker-related crimes. People concerned about stalkers should love their cell phones, not fear them. This whole thing is like the perfect bad story. Nobody is doing their job. Some kid is being a jerk. The family is being irrational and uncreative. Police aren't offering obvious solutions. And the news media is failing to do its homework, speculating irresponsibly, and outright scaremongering. They also say, why back in 2007 didn't the family just not use their cell phones? Nobody was nearly as reliant on them as now. You didn't need them necessarily for work or even to make calls. If they were so terrified, why didn't they just not use them until the problem went away? Also, many people said, why didn't they switch carriers, switch numbers, phones, or accounts? They did that, actually, several times, as well as turning them off and leaving them off, in which case they would turn on again without their doing. Sorry, I had to throw that sidebar in. I'm, I'm trying to be devil's advocate here. That last part was me not being a devil's advocate. The end of this internet, everyone thinks it didn't happen thing. Stalking via cell phone, give me a break, says one article years after the event. Now we're going to go into my personal opinions and theories. I want to say for the record, again, I do not think that this was an elaborate hoax. I do not believe this stalking was done by Courtney or her sister or her mom, Heather. Most internet sleuths online seem to think it was a hoax, but I disagree, as I've told you. The why of it all. Why would any of these women target their own family members? And how wouldn't you get caught? living in the same house as them. Or in the case of Courtney's sister and her friend across the street, if this started happening to you, I think you'd be very cognizant of every single thing they do in your presence in regards to your or their phone, right? You'd be watching your sister or your friend like a hawk, both around your phone and their own phone. When I first wrote this, I was convinced it was a teenaged boy or several of them, most likely from Courtney's school. A suggestion made by a law enforcement official on the case 
was that a tech-savvy teenage boy could have been responsible. While that could be true, the same could be said if restricted stalked the family through more traditional methods. With hackers statistically being from the age of 15 to 25 and cyberbullies being the age of 12 to 17, both predominantly male, I'd say we can arguably say the perp is between the ages of like 14 and 18 and male. Or several teenage males. With multiple types of stalking behaviors, from hacking to peeping through windows, I'd say it would most likely be more than one teenage boy. Also, the amount of time being put into this harassment, it was almost constant. Teenage boys still have to go to school, they have families, they have curfews, they have friends they want to hang out with, typically. So this whole thing, if we believe that it's a teenager, seems to be tag-teamed to me. One hacking, another peeping, etc. If we go down this road, I would also say this is most likely a boy or boys that Courtney went to school with. I'd rule out an online stalker due to all the elements of old-fashioned stalking going on. But another note about old-fashioned stalking, this story was in the press a lot, and that could be a separate incident. A neighborhood kid just wanting to add to their fear and paranoia, and the chances she has an online stalker at the same time as being targeted by someone local and doing the old-fashioned stalking is very slim. That would be fucking crazy. Also, the voice heard over the phone was described as a scratchy teenaged voice. Then there's the context of the overall harassment. It's very immature. This all started with Courtney's phone texting her friends just saying, gay. As the harassment amps up, it does get more frightening, but also in a way of like a teenager who likes horror films and thinks that these phone calls are hilarious. Kind of like that example of that one little dirtbag kid earlier who said that he did the same thing to a girl and thought it was funny. The banging on the house, just all of it does seem very immature. So one or several teenage boys that went to the local school was my first conclusion. And then I came back to this months and months after I'd written it, and lo and behold, I now have another theory, one that I like even better. At first, I did note that in each article, there was one sentence or less about the brother-in-law and the text that he got and how he works at McCord Air Force Base. And that was all that was ever said about it. It was very in passing, like a few words. But then I got to thinking. (laughs) I got, I was like hyper focused on this for a while. Okay, just hear me out. And also allegedly, 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 no one has been convicted of a crime. The statute of limitations on this is over. I might have also looked that up. Okay, no one's going to get in trouble. But let's see this through. So was it a teenaged boy? Or could it be someone else? acting like one, or who wants to be perceived as one, or maybe an adult man who has the emotional equivalent of a teenage boy. Let's circle back to the brother-in-law. Yes, with the amount of time invested into the stalking of the Kirkendall family, it does seem like the work of two or even three teenagers. But with the sophisticated technology that he had access to at work, that's a different story. That might be able to be done by one person who is tech savvy. And once the tech was already up and running, then it would only be the physical old-fashioned stalking to be done, and there was decidedly less of that. The stalker seemed to be doing all three things, spoofing, cloning, and hacking. Some of it could be done remotely, but some of it would need physical access to the phones. Who would be inside the home with physical access to the old phones and then again, the new phones that they got? Who was someone that would be around and be trusted around these phones with all of this going on? A family member, right? You're going to give your new number to your family, even with all this stalking going on. Maybe not friends from school or, or, you know, the neighbor next door that you don't really know, but you're going to give your new number to your family. Okay, so who is family and would be in the house? The brother-in-law. It feels like someone inside. Even, let's say, that it's not this particular brother-in-law, but it seems like it might be someone else inside, but I do think it's more likely that it's him. Okay, so let's go to the root of this entire incident. Courtney. Courtney was most definitely the main target, I believe. So Courtney is targeted And then it spreads to the rest of Courtney's family. Where does it go from there? Across the street to another teenage girl, Courtney's friend Andrea and her family. That is interesting. Two teenage girls physically close to one another and also friends. Then where does it spread next? Darcy Price, Courtney's older sister and her family. Who is Darcy married to? The brother-in-law. And that's where the buck stops. It does not spread 
any further than that. So who is connected to all of these families in some way and has access to their lives and their physical phones and their new phone numbers? Probably a family member. It's a common thread. I think that he's the common thread to everyone that was stalked, including himself, with the ridiculously nice stalking text message that he so happened to receive one time while he was working at the McCord Air Force Base. An interesting sidebar is Mom Heather's friend with her voicemail being changed. I do wonder if she also lived close by or maybe happened to be at the Kirkendall home the same day the voicemail was changed. But again, she has a close relationship with the family, and I just wonder if she lived physically close to them or happened to be close by on that day that it happened. But back to the main cast. How was the marriage between Darcy and her husband? How was his relationship with Heather Kirkendall and her husband? Did he ever pay special attention to Courtney? Did he have a proclivity for young teenage girls, perhaps? Let's say he did have a interest, shall we say, in Courtney. And then also her friend across the street who comes over to hang out all the time, her best friend Andrea. What if on top of that, he resents Darcy, he resents her family, he holds an animosity or anger towards them, has anger issues of some sort, maybe he's vindictive and emotionally immature and lashes out via cyber stalking in a way that looks like a teenage bitch boy but is really a petty, fucking, calculating, emotionally unstable adult with access to government technology and insider knowledge of the homes of the families targeted. Also involving his own family, maybe to get at Darcy, maybe as a red herring, once again to say, hey, it can't be me. Look, I got a text and my wife is getting calls too. With how complicated this stalking was overall, was it one or several teenage boys with tons of time on their hands and government level hacking expertise or one very cunning adult who literally works for the Air Force and had access to the technology who is possibly resentful of his wife and her family and or has an uncomfortable obsession with his teenage niece and her friend. I was a young adult in 2007. I remember perfectly what our phone technology was, or should I say what it wasn't. I don't think it's impossible, but I do think this person was far more tech savvy than most of us are even today. I would love to know how how much he was at the house and hanging around them, what those relationships were like. It's also fitting in this scenario we are running that everything stopped allegedly when the FBI became involved. I could see an adult family man with a military career also being like, oh fuck, now I'm in over my head. He would lose his job, his career, his reputation, possibly his family. He would have been facing criminal charges. I see him or anyone really not wanting to be caught acting like a little bitch boy and to ruin his career and his standing in the community. So yeah, you'd knock it off pretty fucking quick, I would say. All of that is allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. I have a lot of questions, but I find it very strange. I mean, there's one common thread, right? Who else could it? it, I mean, maybe another family member, but that's it. I don't think it's anyone else besides someone inside that family. But no one's ever confessed and there was no big resolution. Just the FBI getting involved, and that's when the calls stopped. The media got very excited about this story, which then led them to report on the very new concept of cyberbullying, as well as the mysterious sexy power of cell phones and how they're a part of our lives all the time now. And then they lost interest and moved on. Well, guess who's not moving on? It's me. What seems likely to you? Do you have another theory? Are there any similar cases that might provide insight as to who the stalker may have been? Do you think it's a brother-in-law like me? Or do you think it's just like a teenage boy fucking around? I want to know. I genuinely do. I will say I'm glad it stopped, though. That must have been really scary for them. Although they probably have a stalker in their family. And we're going to finish up today with animals. One more reminder. Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. I am just spinning my wheels here. I'm brainstorming. I'm trying to figure this out. I don't even know the brother-in-law's name. It was never mentioned in any of the articles. So, you know, the statute of limitations is most definitely up on this crime. No one's going to get in trouble. And if this guy did nothing at all. I'm sorry. Okay. But I'm a little suspicious. But anyways, yeah, I don't even know his name. I don't think you'll be able to find it if you go look for it because I dug through everything and couldn't find it. So he is anonymous completely. And I just potentially ruined his entire life. Just kidding. Um, No one will know who he is. So he'll be fine. But also if you didn't do it, I'm sorry. Okay, bye. And we're gonna finish up today with animals. They're fucking cool. 
We're going to talk about the blue ringed octopus, which is one of the ocean's most adorable and deadly creatures. Don't let the beauty or size of the blue ringed octopus fool you. The body of the tiny octopus doesn't get much bigger than a golf ball and can be as small as a penny. While the blue ringed octopus is quite stunning, with bright yellow skin patterned with small blue rings that intensify when it is threatened or under stress, this octopus is extremely venomous. The blue ringed octopus is native to the Pacific Ocean from Australia and Indonesia to the Philippines, Japan, and South Korea. They live in coral reefs and tide pools, and when they're not out hunting for food or looking for a mate. They hide in crevices or shells. They generally eat small crustaceans such as crabs and shrimp and live for about two years. Aside from its striking coloring, what the blue ringed octopus is most famous for is its highly toxic venom. Its venom is 1,000 times more powerful than cyanide and each octopus has enough venom to kill more than 20 humans within minutes. The deadly venom is a powerful neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin, the same venom found in pufferfish. While their bite may be very toxic, the blue ringed octopuses are generally not a danger to humans. They usually won't bite unless provoked. So what happens if a person does get bitten? The venom lasts between 12 and 48 hours, depending on the size of the person and how much venom they get from the bite. The venom is a postsynaptic blocker, which means it blocks neurotransmitters or nerve signals in the body. That means the person bitten will go limp in what is known as flaccid paralysis. <laughs> We've all seen a little flaccid paralysis every now and then, huh? Actually, no, I never have. Oh, wait, there was one guy. That one guy with the parrot. I imagine it happens to a lot of people, though. This only affects smooth muscles, so while it doesn't affect the heart, it does hit the diaphragm, so the person will stop breathing. This happens within minutes of being bitten. Other signs of flaccid paralysis could be nausea, blurred vision, or difficulty swallowing. That is low-hanging fruit, and I'm not going to say it. And the bad news is that there is no anti-venom available, so emergency care would be required immediately. Because they're nocturnal and they're very shy and they give plenty of warning as well, you really would have to be very stubborn to get bitten, some dude said. I didn't write who he is. Morse. Morse said. The venom is very potent and there isn't an anti-venom, but the venom does wear off, so if the bitten person could get life-saving techniques during that time, they could be okay, said some dude. The good news is there are only a few bites to humans every year, and there have been only three known deaths from the blue ringed octopus bites. That's likely because blue ringed octopuses mostly use their venom to hunt and to eat. When they're young, they eat very small shrimps. It was written in the article as shrimps. I like it. I would have said shrimp, but shrimps is cute. And as they get older and bigger, they take down crabs and small prawns. To feed, they use their venom in a couple of ways by jumping on the back of their prey and cracking the shell with their beak and then injecting the venom directly into the wound or by releasing a cloud of venom into the water near the prey so they will take it in through their gills. Crabs, for example, have an open circulatory system, so the venom goes through their body pretty quickly and they go limp. Blue ringed octopuses generally feed on crustaceans that are equal to or smaller than the size of their own heads. Same. Yum. I want crab. Blue ringed octopuses, even though they have venom, usually don't take too many risks because a large crab could still do some damage, that dude says. Morse says. Anything bigger is probably not worth it for them. One mystery of the blue ringed octopus, according to that dude, is exactly how it gets its venom and when. We do know that the octopuses don't produce the venom themselves. Instead, it's produced by bacteria in their salivary glands. However, what is still not clear is where these bacteria come from or how the venom is passed from parent to child, as even larvae in eggs produce the venom. We really don't know if you were to keep the octopuses in captivity, if they would need to be exposed to something or eat something to maintain their venom, that dude said. But as long as they are producing venom, they will remain one of the deadliest animals in the ocean. And they're freaking cute. I'll have lots of photos. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you were entertained. I hope you have some theories because I want to hear. And I don't know. Do you think I'm onto something or am I dumb? Or was it some little shithead next door? What do you think? That's it for today. Thank you for listening. I'm going to go now. I love you. Have a good rest of your day. And that's it. Okay.
Bye. Full source notes are available at Mistress of the Macabre Podcast.com as well as photos pertaining to each episode. Follow along on Instagram for all the insane and gory photos at Mistress of the Macabre Podcast. Please leave a five star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps the show grow and I will love you forever. And tell a friend if you even have any. Bonus content is available at Patreon.com or on Apple Podcast subscriptions. I'm just one young teenage girl writing, researching, producing, editing, and recording the show. Your support goes a long way. If you have topic ideas, questions, comments, animal facts, or unsettling stories you'd like to share, email me at mistressofthemacabrepodcast at gmail.com.